1997, one year after the events of the movie, the Stargate has been sealed with a blanket. Are you f***ing serious? And is kept under guard. Suddenly it activates and a bunch of heavily armored aliens step through, kill the man and kidnap a woman. In response to this, the successor to General West, Lieutenant General George Hammond, portrayed by Donis Davis, recalls Jack O'Neill for questioning. Jack O'Neill, with two L's and portrayed by Richard Dean Anderson, is being told that Earth was attacked by Ra. With Kowalski and Ferretti, with two R's, also being brought in for interrogation, O'Neill quickly catches onto the military's plan of sending another nuke to Abydos, the place of the movie. This is when O'Neill admits to have faked his final report, and that the nuke detonated in space without harming the Abedonians, or Daniel Jackson for that matter. The general is, understandably, pretty pissed off at that and sends Jack into his corner for being a bad boy. That's when the old soldiers reunite. Contrary to Jack, Charles Kowalski, portrayed by J. R. Cavone, and Louis Ferretti, who is played by Brent State, both stayed in the military and were promoted to major each. Then Hammond returns and isn't too happy about the few thousand people still living on Abydos, which is why he sends the nuke and kills them all. Nah, just kidding. Which is when General Hammond is convinced by O'Neill to send him and a team back to Abydos and retrieve information as well as Daniel Jackson, in order to find out if he's still alive. O'Neill sends a box of tissues through the Stargate so that Daniel knows it's them and not some evil glowy eyes wannabe god or the US military. Honestly, not sure which is worse. One wants to terrorize them, the other one wants to nuke them. O'Neill is reactivated as Lieutenant Colonel and is being told that this time he won't be putting his team together. Hammond assigns Kowalski, Ferretti, a few airmen and Captain Samantha Carter, portrayed by Amanda Tapping, to the team and Sam immediately smears her guts all over her superior's faces. She's an astrophysicist coming straight from the Pentagon and goddamn, can I just mention that this is how you introduce a female character? The team goes through the gate and meet Daniel, now portrayed by Michael Shanks, Skara and Shari on the other side. Daniel makes clear that Ra is in fact dead and that this new attacker must have come from somewhere else. Maybe he's got a brother Ray. Daniel shows the team a cartoon she discovered in which a few hundred gate symbol combinations are written down, which is when the Abedonians at the Stargate are attacked. Ferretti is lethally injured, Skara and Shari are kidnapped and many of the others die or are close to it. The team returns to the camp only to see that they are too late. Heartbroken, Jackson tells the natives that they have to bury the gate and after one year he will return with his wife. Back on Earth, the general is not exactly happy to see half of his team dead. Again. Especially with an archaeologist who was considered to be KIA making demands of wanting to join O'Neill's team. Kowalski stays by Ferretti's side while Jack brings Daniel to his house to catch a beer, because the military doesn't really know what to do with him. I mean, what exactly are you supposed to do with a thought to be dead archaeologist? Back on planet we don't know yet, the head warrior takes the formerly kidnapped US soldier and brings her to his god Ray, portrayed by Peter Williams, who brainwashes her, forcibly undresses her, but doesn't like her and she's being killed by electrocution. This is when we first see reasonable doubts within the head warrior, portrayed by Christopher Judge. Back on Earth, Carter explains that the reason why random dialing to random gates doesn't work is because of planetary drifting. General Hammond states that in his personal opinion, they should just bury the Stargate and stay out of the intergalactic business. Unfortunately, he already received new orders from the president. No, not this president. Not this one. Not this one either. This one would be it, but as of now we'll pretend that this is just the president. Said president ordered a new command around the Stargate with General Hammond supervising the facility, nine special teams being ordered into action through the Stargate alongside additional personnel. Colonel O'Neill will take leadership of his own team designated SG-1 and Major Kowalski leads SG-2. 
The mission goal of all teams is exploration, danger assessment and diplomatic negotiations. The existence of the Stargate and anything related to it has been classified top secret, with heavy restrictions as only the President and his Joint Chiefs know about it. Essentially, the SGC has become a huge black op. Daniel insists on joining SG-1 by making clear that he'll go through the gate to find his wife no matter what happens, which is good enough for the Colonel and the General. Enough with the details, because Ferretti wakes up and shows them the coordinates to Ray's planet. By the way, this is Major Samuels, portrayed by Robert Wisden. He reminds SG-2 that if SG-1 is to be killed or captured, that they have to return without them. Kowalski, however, refuses to accept the order. Oh boy, so this is where the fun begins. SG-1 and 2 arrive at the planet. You figure out yet how to align this gate to get back home? Yeah, the device is the same as on Abydos. This symbol represents Did you a... brief Kowalski's team yet? Yes, the symbol represents Good job. a... Quick interception of Ra forcibly brainwashing and undressing Shari and OH NO! During reconnaissance, SG-1 stumbles upon a bunch of priests who tell Daniel that this place is known as Chulak. And similar to the Abedonians, SG-1 is being invited as God. The difference this time is that SG-1 is already aware of what's going to happen to them later. Or snap shit! Here's Ray. Apophis. But I think we're just going to call him Ray presents his new wife, Amonette, complete with snakehead and everything. Wait, that came out wrong. The team is captured and they reunite with Skara before they are interrogated by the head warrior. Daniel shows them from which planet they came from, but he's not a big fan of writing either. Jackson proceeds to tell Carter about the legend of the Apophis and what he meant in human history. Apophis is a giant snake god and greatest enemy of Ra, also known as the ancient Egyptian god of chaos. Amunet, however, is a bigger question mark, known to be one of Ra's wives. She was the goddess of air and invisibility, but she was eventually overshadowed by mood and popularity. Anyway, long story short, Daniel's point is that these Goa'uls, as they call themselves, are literally living their lives as gods and behave in similar manners. Bada bim, bada bang, Apophis needs one more host for his boy scout. And after Daniel fails to offer himself as a tribute to get closer to his wife, they catch Skara out of the crowd. Unfortunately, as Apophis has only gathered prisoners for the sake of spraying more of his good old kin, he gives the execution order for everyone else. That's when the head warrior has to make a choice. Join O'Neill and betray Apophis, or stay with them and kill all unarmed prisoners. Obviously, as we still have like 10 seasons ahead of us, he kills his former comrades and saves the humans. He introduces himself as Tia and tells the colonel that they still have a chance to save Skahara, as well as showing them what a Jafar is. An enhanced human with roughly three times the normal lifespan who carries the pouch with an infant parasite in his stomach. These parasites, these little snakes, are known as Gorwold and they're the ones acting as gods. During the escape, SG-1 is attacked by a glider that has ring transportation. Uh, sorry, but this is being retconned starting from like the next episode as well, so just forget this was a thing. It would cause a few too many plot holes, I think. O'Neill and Tia take it out just in time for Jack to meet up with Gaara, only to find out that he's already been possessed by a ghoul. O'Neill wants to talk him out of it, but can't pass his mighty slap hand. With a battalion of enemy Jafar closing in, SG-1, 2 and prisoners like this rock-throwing dude fight for their lives to escape. They punch in their authorization code so that they won't get squashed by the new titanium barrier and make it out safely with the exception of Kowalski, who has been infected with the lava gold that jumped out of a Jafar's corpse. That this guy killed, by the way. Back home, the team takes a breather only for the general to ask, What the f*** did this happen? And that was the first episode of Season 1 of Stargate SG-1. It takes about an hour to get going, but it's a great pilot episode for a reason. I might even go as far as to say that this one and a half hour long pilot episode might be the best part of Season 1, but we'll be getting to that. Other than that, nothing much has changed. Thief is still being worked on and I'm not quite done with Gothic yet either. 
With that in mind, see you next time with the second episode of the first season of Stargate SG-1. Have a nice one.